Welcome to the podcast that puts a finger on the pulse of medicine and technology. On this show, you'll hear from investors, industry executives, and healthcare providers on the science and business of medicine. I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib, and this is the State of MedTech. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. So this one is a product leadership episode and I have a very special guest. I was excited to have him on. He's somebody I've known through, you know, for a while actually, um, just through the grapevines of robotic surgery, but it was the first time actually he and I spoke and that's Lucien Blondel. So how do I know him? Well, 10 years ago, man, even more than 10 years ago, when I started my career, I started at Mazor Robotics. It was the world's first robotic spine company. And Lucien was at our, well, some people think it was a competitor, um, but we, in my opinion, and Lucien's, we weren't competing against each other. Um, he was over at MedTech Rosa, another um, a neurosurgical, a robotic neurosurgical platform that also started doing spine. And, you know, two great companies competing. And in reality, what we were competing was not against each other, but against the status quo, which was freehand surgery. Fast forward uh, more than a decade later, and you know there's I don't know like 11, 12 different robotic companies in the spine spine uh, space, and it's become a standard now. And so Lucien back then he was uh, he started off in, as an R and D director at MedTech uh, Rosa, uh, MedTech SA that is MedTech Rosa is the 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 robot which was acquired by Zimmer, Mazor was later acquired by uh, Medtronic. And he uh, quickly became their chief technology officer after a couple of years. So after the acquisition at Zimmer, what do you go on to next? Well, you know, like a true startup guy like myself, um, you can only, you know, handle being in a large company for so long before you just lose your mind and go to something else. So he actually went on to co-found and become the CTO of Quantum Surgical, really interesting technology uh, company. So Quantum Surgical is a medical robotics startup with a mission to democratize minimally invasive cancer treatment globally. Uh, they developed a robotic platform called Epion, which combines advanced robotics, preoperative planning, software, artificial intelligence, and navigation technology to assist a physician in performing safer and more efficient, efficient uh, percutaneous ablations in the liver. So as we know, like liver, um, you know, cancer of the liver and, and, you know, there's so many other issues that happen there, you know, uh, it, the, the, the procedures are all done essentially manually, right? And so me personally, aside from liver, I feel like a technology like this has an opportunity to really open up other applications in, in soft tissue. Um, but yeah, that's what he's doing now. So in this episode, we talk about his journey as a product leader in robotics. Um, we talk about quantum surgical and the, the, the platform. If you are interested to see the video of this, you can of course go to quantumsurgical.com. Or if you're watching this on Spotify or YouTube, I actually do a screen share and we actually talk through the technology, which is a lot of fun. Plus, uh, Lucien, who is also uh, a prolific content creator on LinkedIn, this is one thing that I want to see more of in our industry, which is leaders who are in management positions like Lucien producing content, not only to tell a story about their tech, uh, about their company, but to share their insights, their leadership. So he actually, aside from being active on LinkedIn and, and posting, he has his own uh, podcast. His podcast is called the Less Invasive po Podcast, um, where essentially they talk about minimally invasive surgery and technologies that enable those techniques, which includes things like robotics, surgical navigation, augmented reality, VR, telehealth, and more. It's a, you know available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and, and all those other uh, platforms. So before you go and subscribe to his podcast, which by the way, I recommend you know, we have a great audience for the state of MedTech. So let's let's really support Lucien. Go and subscribe to his podcast. Give him a five star rating, right? And of course, write a review. But be sure that before you do that, that you've actually done that for this show. So if this is not your first episode listening to the state of MedTech, shame on you. I want you to stop what you're doing. Take five seconds. Give us five star rating, subscribe to the show, and write a little review. It helps us because we've actually broken into the top one percent of all healthcare podcasts, believe it or not. So I wanna I wanna go for that number one spot. So after you do that, go give Lucien some love. Go subscribe to his podcast. I really want to show uh, that our audience is uh, full of fantastic people, which it is. So let's go support him. So with that being said, here 
is our episode with Lucien Blondel, CTO and co-founder of Quantum Surgical. Enjoy. What's going on, everybody? Happy Monday. And what a great episode I have for you guys today. Now, usually we record these, but I said, hey, what the hell? We haven't done a live stream on the state of med tech maybe in a few weeks. And I said, let me do it for this one because this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. It's my first love in med tech, and that would be surgical robotics. So the surgical robotics game has changed quite a lot. We went from very unique platforms uh, 10, 20 years ago till now, where a lot of the robotic uh, systems can be considered essentially commoditized, right? So it really takes a lot to bring a new and disruptive piece of robotic uh, technology to the market. And so for that, I wanted to bring on a guest that you guys know him very well from the world of surgical robotics, and that's Lucien Blondel. Lucien is the uh, co-founder and CTO of Quantum Surgical. Quantum Surgical is a new and exciting surgical robotics company uh, that's changing the way interventional, uh, uh, interventional oncology is done. I almost uh, tripped up with my words there. So let me bring him to the show. And here he is. Lucien, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, doing very well. And I see that people are joining, so welcome everybody. And the first thing I'm gonna say, as always, is hey, go ahead and comment what city you're joining from. We always like to know what city you're joining from and we'll kind of give some shout outs to people since this is a live show. But Lucien, um, maybe before we get started to talk shop, as they say, why don't you give us a little background? Tell us about yourself and how you got into the world of med tech and surgical robotics. All right, I'll try to make it short. Uh, so I always worked actually in, a, in a surgical robotics. I'm an engineer by background. Uh, I graduated in a 2001 and actually the last year internship, I did it in a research lab that was uh, developing a teleoperated robot for minimally invasive surgery. And the goal was to uh, bring a European competitor to the intuitive surgical Da Vinci system. Uh, it, it never made a, a product because it was more a research lab uh, consortium. But that's where I started. That's where I discovered this field, minimally invasive surgery, endoscopy, robotics. Uh, at the time, it was intuitive surgical and computer motion uh, leading on the, on the market. Then I uh, took a gap year. I traveled uh, around the world with a, a project with uh, children and uh, and schools. And when I when I came back, I uh, I reached out to uh, Bertrand Naum, who uh, actually started a new company called MedTech SA uh, in France, and uh, with uh, the goal to uh, to uh, develop a surgical robot in orthopedics. So we started in uh, 2002 with a, a first robot called Bridget. Uh, that we uh, developed, that we uh, got uh, C marked FDA clearance, and that uh, technology later on was acquired by uh, Zimmer in uh, 2006. And then we moved on to uh, the cranial neurosurgery space. We developed uh, the robot called Rosa uh, for keyhole neurosurgery, electrode placement, biopsy, uh, very uh, precise uh, procedures. And uh, we went again to uh, the market with the CE mark FDA clearance and uh, trying to conquer uh, the US, uh, European countries, also Asia, uh, China was a, a big market for us uh, from France headquarters. Then I took another gap year. I traveled uh, around Asia and uh, I came back. I worked uh, a couple of years at, uh, at GE Healthcare, a great company, great culture. I worked, uh, I helped them on the innovative project that was to bring a robotics, mobile robotics, into the hybrid uh, operating room. Basically, a, a big mobile robot that uh, moves around the operating table to uh, put an angiography system that's high-powered uh, interventional uh, radiology imaging uh, equipment that is not uh, usually in the operating room. And so they have this uh, this, uh, this wonderful project. I, I worked there. I supported the first customers. And then I went back to uh, MedTech uh, to uh, work on the Rosa Spine. So that was the spine application of uh, robotics, uh, again, CMARC and FDA clearance. And at that time, uh, there were already a, a lot of players on the market. You know, the microsystem, uh, Smith & Nephew, all other players had their uh, own robotic technology. And Zimmer Biomet was scouting, uh, you know, the world to uh, find what they could do. Uh, what technology could be of interest for, for them. And, and they found uh, our company once again, and uh, they acquired MedTech in uh, 2016. And in 2017, in uh, February, we started a new company called Quantum Surgical uh, with a goal to introduce robotics to a new market. And 
few months later, we found this new market that is international uh, oncology, and we started with minimally invasive cancer treatment for uh, liver. Very nice. Very nice. And it's a great history. And I appreciate you saying that one interesting that thing that people don't know about is that, you know, uh, while you're at MedTech Rosa, I start off my career at Missouri Robotics, which um, a lot of people, I think they, they make the mistake of saying, oh, they were competitors. Well, yes, we were competing, uh, competing, you know, for market share. I kind of feel like we competed together because both MedTech Rosa and Mazor, we were competing against the standard at the time and really trying to push and pioneer this idea of robotic surgery. And I'm very proud of like the time that I spent there because now, I mean, I don't know, there's like 10, 15 robotic spine companies, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you remember back in the day when, when you and I, uh, at our respective companies, um, when surgeons would Trump come and, uh, either laugh or try and pick fights about, about whether robotics was going to be a thing or not, you know? And so I really miss those days. Those are, you know, fantastic days. You know? Yeah, I mean, def definitely, uh, you don't want to be alone in your market to introduce robotics. Uh, it's always better to have one other company that is betting, that is investing in, in this technology, that is validating your, your hypothesis. And uh, when you start this kind of te new technology in a new market, you need to educate a lot the market about what is robotics, what is uh, pre-planning, uh, what is uh, you know confirmation of the treatment with the with the software and stuff like that, and so this takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it's uh, most efficient when a couple of companies uh, is do is pushing in the same direction. Then obviously uh, companies who are competing on some deals and stuff like that. This is I mean uh, this is business as usual, uh, but uh, when you when you introduce robotics, uh, you need uh, really to. Uh, there is a really high effort to be done to educate the market and the, and the prospect customers. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I got some questions that I want to kind of run through with you. It's, uh, 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 there's a lot of things that I can ask you. And of course, for our audience uh, who's watching, by the way, I see a few people chiming in. So Melissa Clement from Detroit. Thanks, Melissa, for joining. Um, if you have a question from the audience, go ahead and drop it in the comments. We'll ask it. First thing I want to ask you, uh, Lucien, is... Um, you know, what do you think is different today about robotic surgery compared to like, let's say just 10 years ago? I know that's kind of a broad question, but like what comes to mind? I think it's, uh, I would say uh, it, it, it's much easier right now to uh, do a, a surgical robot, uh, basically because there are technologies is more mature. You have off the shelf uh, technologies that already integrate a lot of the hardware and the software together so that you, and you also have technologies for, you know, multimodal planning uh, software on medical images, CT, uh, MRI. 10, 15 years ago, you had to do everything by yourself. Right now, you have a lot of, uh, you know, SDK, APIs, pre-designed software and hardware that help you focus on the indication and what you want to do with these technologies. So it's much easier on the technology side, I would say, at least on the on our side, which is, you know, surgical assistant uh, devices. And also you have much, much, much more people who have uh, experience like 10, 15, even 20 years of experience in uh, surgical robotics. So you can quickly set up, maybe not quickly, but you can um, more quickly set up a team of experienced engineers, uh, medical sales, uh, quality regulatory, uh, all those people that you really need and clinical clinical affairs to really uh, make sure that uh, you will um, design and uh, get clearance for the for the right uh, product. So I, I would say right now it's uh, easier than uh, 10 years uh, before. And there are some segments, market segments, where it's still uh, the challenge of introducing robotics and some segments where the technology has been there for uh, one or two decades and they are more competing on, you know, what differentiating from an existing product than uh, creating a new uh, a, a new product so <clears throat> i think the the challenges are, are not the same right now now i got another question for you and it's a little more of a controversial one this is kind of a controversial show i forgot to tell you that <laughs> uh, <laughs> but here let me uh uh i'm gonna type this out so this is this is a little bit a little bit in my opinion less controversial but still controversial so i mean What's wrong with surgical robotics today? I, I have a few thoughts myself, but I'm wondering for you, when you think about surgical robotics as a whole, I mean, look, intuitive, um, you have to always pay a little respect for what they've done. However, I think surgical robotics is kind of a, a, a failure to some extent, because if you look at soft tissue surgery, robotics is used maybe in 
3% of surgeries, right? So there's still, I mean, it's been 20 years. So there's still a lot that, to be done there. That's just on the soft tissue side. But just in general, when you think of surgical robotics, what do you think is wrong with it today that, that needs to improve? You know, because we need to like move, move to the next level, I think, in technology. Yeah, I think, I mean, two things. First, I would not say, uh, I, I would say something different about surgical robotics. You, on, on, on the whole, you're right, only 3% of minimally invasive surgeries are done with a robot. But my example on uh, epilepsy surgery in cranial neurosurgery, I think more than, I would say, 70% of level four epilepsy centers in the US, they use a robot. And I think in radical prostatectomy, I think that's kind of the same figures, maybe eight, more than 80% of the procedures are done with a robot. So there are very specific indications where robotics has proven a huge benefit. Uh, either for safety or for accuracy or for uh, efficiency, time reduction, radiation reduction, there can be different uh, and, and, and different uh, uh, benefits from robotics. But it cannot address, you know, one robot cannot address all the indications, all the challenges of all the procedures. So that's mm -hmm. why right now we have like 150, 200 different companies and surgical robots. And that takes time because, you know, creating one surgical robot, it's not like just one small instrument. It takes five, 10 years. Look at the GNG with the Otava system. Look at the Medtronic with the Hugo system. It takes 10 years to create a surgical robot and to start to bring it, bring it to the market. And then it takes another five to 10 years to grow clinical adoption. So it takes a lot of time. And I think we are maybe uh, a bit too impatient when it comes to uh, surgical robotics, this technology. It uh, has an impact on how people, the clinical team is doing the procedure, how they do their, their workflow. Uh, the, it's not just one surgeon. I mean, it's the x-ray technologist, it's the anesthesiologist, it's the, the nurse, the sterile nurse, the circulating nurse, uh, the, the, the guy who is scheduling the OR. Everybody in the OR world is impacted by a, a big robot. So it, mm -hmm. it takes time. So I would not say it's a, it's a, it's a failure. I think Yes, probably for some indication, it failed to prove enough value to justify the cost, the upfront cost and recurring cost that uh, goes with the com commercially available system that uh, people have today. But uh, on the cost, there are new uh, entrants on the market. There are new options, uh, lighter system uh, different ways to purchase the system and to uh, pay per use. And, and, and so now people start to have options for two decades. They didn't have any option but to buy the Da Vinci, which is a great technology, by the way, uh, from Intuitive Surgical. So the more we get uh, different, the more physicians, surgeons get the different options, the more they will be able to choose between various approaches and select the right one for the right procedure for their own needs, for their own patients. And I I don't believe there is one robot for everything. So I think they... I agree. Yeah, they need to pick which system they want to use for their practice and, and their, their, their own patient for the benefit of their patient. I, I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, the thing is, um, while a hospital might want uh, a robot to do like many things, everybody wants that. If we look at our own lives, right? I mean, look, I'm sitting here in my, in my office. You know, I... I have two different cameras. There's a camera I use to do my streaming and everything. There's another camera one I do use to do meetings, you know, and I think that the benefit is that as technologies improve and get better, we start to realize that we're more drawn to the companies and products that focus on one specific thing and does it very, 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 very well. You know, yeah. um, like even, I mean, look, social media, we don't, we don't all use Facebook. You know, mm -hmm. if it's photography related, you know, we use Instagram. If we want to look into other things, it's Twitter. I think it's the same thing with the surgical robotics, right? It's really difficult to have a robot that even for like a procedure like spine does everything, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I totally agree with that. Now, uh, I want to bring up um, uh, in a little bit of video um, about quantum surgical from your website, because I, I want to show everybody the, the technology. It's a very interesting technology, but let's start out with a simple question. Like, why do interventional uh, oncologists need robotics? Like, what, you know, of all the places also, because if you were coming out of spine, I figured maybe you'd move into orthopedics or something, but you went to interventional oncology. How did that happen? Why? Yeah, so the, the, the story is that uh, we... <coughs> 
with a, my we were four co-founders from uh, coming from the previous uh, history of the the Rosa robot, and we just took the decision to start a new company in surgical robotics. That's all we agreed on, and then we took uh, maybe six months, maybe more, uh, to figure out which market was in need for robotics and so it you know it's not just an idea that we had like that and we say okay let's go for uh, for io basically we, we looked at uh, a couple of uh, factors one was is where there is a clinical need to have assistance to place an instrument or manipulate an instrument with some level of accuracy so any kind of free end procedure that is challenging the second is where there could be benefit from planning on multimodal images, so images from various modalities, CT, MRI, T1, T2, ultrasound, whatever. And, and, and then where well, there was a new technique that well, has proven a lot of benefit for the patient that was minimally invasive or percutaneous, but that was too difficult to uh, perform manually, freehand, and hmm. uh, to really grow and and uh, be adopted at a, at a high scale. So that was that were basically the three factors that were the success of the Rosa robot in uh, in uh, epilepsy surgery. The epilepsy surgery, the the keyhole technique, uh, was uh, people in Europe was, were doing this with stereotactic frame for two decades, but very limited to a few centers because it's a very very complex procedures. It took hours to perform. It was very it was, uh, you know, uh, there, were, there were high risks of complications. And when we brought robotics, then it unlocked this kind of uh, new technique for patients, younger patients in the US. So instead of mm -hmm. doing a, a, a huge craniotomy, you just insert electrode, but you insert them deep into the brain. So just this to say is we were looking to uh, a kind of similar uh, situation. And that's where we found that people... Uh, in, in France and in, all over the world, we are using a very uh, minimally invasive technique, which is percutaneous, to treat uh, a curative treatment for cancer, which is really important. But it was very challenging because it was guided by uh, imaging, but uh, CT imaging is not real time and everything moves mm. into the, in, in the body and stuff like that. So right. we figured out this was uh, uh, at the right spot to bring the most value. And basically, I'm pretty sure that uh, all therapeutic uh, segment markets, procedures, will have to benefit some, somehow from, let's say, computer-assisted uh, tools. And, and, and this, 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 this was a procedure where there, there was no navigation, no robotics, only it's visual crazy. guidance. You know, it's, so it's just yeah. a, a lot of experience, a lot of expertise in the hands, in the hands and in the, in the eyes and in the mental space of right. the interventional oncologist to you know, think in 3D and while looking at a screen and inserting a needle it's just too complex. It's so. too complex. And, you know, that's fine. Like from, you know, cause everything is, is about the patient. That's fine. If you're in a big city or you're close to somebody yep. who's, who's got a lot of expertise, but if you're a patient and you're in an area where maybe this physicians, they don't do this procedure as often they're new, like there's so much variability. And I think that's the biggest thing about robotics is that, and I don't like to use the word democratize, but like, this is one area where it can essentially level the playing field so that whether you're in, you know, in Paris or in the middle of nowhere, if you're a patient, you go to get a procedure done, you can expect the same level of outcome and, and efficacy done, no matter who's doing it, whether it's a nude physician, more experienced one, small hospital, big hospital, you know, this whole concept of healthcare, where if you have money, right, or you mm -hmm. can afford it, then you fly and you go to a very nice hospital. But then if you don't, then, you know, <laughs> you get, you get whatever you're able to, you know, yeah, so I, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I think robotics maybe not democratized, but standardized. I mean, the, the thing there is, we go. when, when like it's it. freehand, yeah. when it's freehand, and it's realized the, the outcomes on the patient relies on the expertise and experience of the surgeon, then there is no standard. You go to the the guy that who does three hundred of these cases a year. You you go to the big center because. <coughs> They've seen a lot of different cases and, and, and even the rare cases they are able to uh, op operate on the patient, but it's not so standardized. So robotics, pre-planning software, confirmation software, mm -hmm. all these tools that will help to 
standardize a kind of a minimal approach to, uh, to, to this kind of procedure. Then the expert will be able to go one step further and the most complex patient that they were not treating today, they will be able to do that and they will be able to change the technique and, and prepare the future. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it makes sense. We got to, and um, before I bring up uh, the, uh, the quantum surgical video, I kind of want to talk through, we have, we have a good question. So uh, Gangandeep Singh asked uh, this question. He said, it seems to me that AI or artificial intelligence will play a paramount role in surgical robotics and shaping its future. Can you share your perspective on this? I have different thoughts, but like, you know, this is the, this is the natural, like next question about robotics. Like it's AI. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think there are two different ways to integrate AI into robotics. And um, I think for like soft tissue robotics, AI needs data. I mean, it's just a, another and, way. And a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it. A lot of good annotated label data, data sets, thousands of images of, 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 of any kind. So when it comes to soft tissue robotics, of course, there is all this data coming from the uh, endoscopic laparoscope uh, images, the video feed. And this, obviously, there could be huge benefits. We don't know exactly what. We don't know exactly why. Uh, but uh, everybody, uh, I was talking to a general surgeon who said, okay, for me, the next, the future of surgical robotics is the data and the AI, because the more we can connect the data with the patient outcomes, the more we can connect the pre, the intra, and the post-op data with the patient outcomes, the more we can connect this with how I perform my surgery. Is it how many instruments I use, how I move my instruments, where I place my laparoscope? I don't know. But if the AI can figure out why for this specific patient, uh, I think I did like any other day, but the patient outcome was better, then if the AI can tell me, okay, it was better because this and this, and this I analyzed based on thousands of your previous uh, procedures. So this is a potential <coughs> benefit from AI. This is not really where we are right now in soft tissue robotics. They are starting to have this digital surgery platform, all the infrastructure uh, to retrieve the images, to annotate, and then to be able then to leverage and, and, and provide more insight to, uh, to the surgeon. So will it play a paramount role? I think it will play a growing role. I will, I'm not sure it will be the main role in surgical robotics. So, a, a surgical robot still is maintaining, guiding, or uh, inserting an instrument into the, the patient anatomy. That's the first reason we have a surgical robot. Then the AI will, on top of this, provide insight on the data and stuff like that. On our field, which is not surgery, that's interventional radiology, we rely on medical images, CT, MRI, to uh, identify the tumor. That could be very small tumors. Uh, and make sure that the treatment, so the zone that has been destroyed by uh, radiofrequency, microwave, or cryoablation, is actually covering the tumor with adequate margin. And this is done visually. So they compare, they, they, they take one screen, they take the other screen, and they, they look, and they say, okay, I think I've covered enough of my tumor. Obviously, AI here, it's more AI in radiology, you know, a, a medical imaging AI can automate a lot of these tasks to really uh, analyze the images before, after ablation, and give the results and ties this to probable outcome. So right now in our, in our field, we know that you have a early, very early stage liver cancer. Uh, if the physician ablates a five millimeter or 10, 10 millimeter margin, depending on the, on the, on the kind of uh, cancer. So let's say five millimeter margin, you will have a lower recurrence uh, of uh, local, local cancer recurrence. So this, this has been proven by literature. And this is the kind of thing that the AI could uh, you know, provide during the intervention to say, okay, give me your images and I will tell you what the level of probability that you will get a local recurrence of the cancer. So this is the type of inf insight information that AI will bring, but AI will not drive, you know, uh, the additional uh, needle into the tumor to finish uh, and to complete the ablation. There will still be a physician, there will still be a robot to actually do something, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, honestly, just on the topic of, uh, of, of uh, oops, why is that coming up? There we go. Um, I think on the topic of like AI and robotics, like I think the first step is like, 
robotics has to be a lot more standardized and a lot of people have to be using it. Once that happens, then more companies will, because again, to your point, like it's not just data you need, you need like good, clean data. And so I don't think there's any, maybe, maybe in, probably intuitive, but like outside of intuitive, maybe CMR. I don't think anybody's mm -hmm. thinking about like, how do we make sure it's really clean data? People are just, you know, a lot of companies like for quantum surgery, we aren't, you're not thinking about AI right now. You're thinking about how do we make it easier for physicians to adopt robotics, start seeing those, those benefits and everything. So I think like before you start worrying about the benefits of AI, you got to worry about the benefits of the actual tool in your hand yep. at the moment first, you know, you can't do two things at once, you know? So. Yeah. And, and you need to collect data with your own surgical robots. I mean, because probably that that's where it will uh, it will be uh, the most efficient. So you need you need time to uh, raise clinical adoption, get enough data, label of this data, make sure that you label annotate correctly, <coughs> and then run your AI uh, models. And the AI model is not the issue here. I mean, right now there are a lot of models that are available. It's just have the right data set that is representative of what you want to prove, and that is clean. Totally. Totally. Let me let me do this, Lucian. Do you mind if I bring up um, Quantum Surgical's uh, robotic yep. video? Let's kind of like talk talk it through. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Okay. So <laughs> there, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Now, if you're in medical sales, you're going to want to listen to this, whether you're a capital sales rep, an associate sales rep, maybe you're a VP leading a sales team, or perhaps you're the uh, CEO and founder of a company and you're doing your first sales hire. Let's face it, uh, medical sales has changed quite a lot from just the past few years, but let me tell you how much it's changed and more importantly, how bad it's gotten. There's a company called Access Monitor that did a survey of over 347,000 physicians over the period of about eight or nine years, right? And they started in 2008 and they wanted to see what percentage of physicians were accessible to reps. And the way they defined that is, if a physician took 70% of the calls that a rep made, they were considered accessible. So if a physician gets 100 diff uh, calls from different reps throughout the year, they take 70 of them, that's considered accessible. So in 2008, that number was 80%. And then in less than a decade, that number every year dropped little by little. And then over time, the, com the compounding effects of that had a huge effect, uh, impact because in 2016, that number dropped all the way down to 44%. Now, right now, we're, we're in 2022 and we're about to start 2023. So fast forward six, seven years, how much more lower is that number? And based on the variable of the 2020 lockdown, how much lower do you think it could have gotten? Now, based on my analysis and, and modeling of that, that number is less than 3% at this point. Think, think about that. Your sales team, every time they go outbound, they have a 3% chance of getting in touch with somebody because only 3% of physicians are actually accessible to reps, right? So how do you differentiate? How do you actually put yourself to be in a position to be successful? Well, the good news is that you're listening to this commercial. And the best part is that the majority of companies out there, and when I say majority, I mean 99% of them because I've audited so many of them, have not invested a penny into updating their sales training or having their sales reps know, how do you actually sell and persuade somebody who you can't see in person, right? And I had this issue back in 2020, and let me tell you about the new way, the different way, right? And that is digital medical sales. You see, back in 2020, I was part of a, a small startup. We sold uh, capital equipment for, to critical care uh, departments. And I was able to use a digital medical sales strategy to put 35 deals in 60 days during 2020, during, during the lockdown. That's right, 35 deals. And those deals ranged from uh, deals like Johns Hopkins, UCSF, University of Kansas, to uh, HCA facilities, small regional hospitals, right? The idea is how do you use digital channels such as LinkedIn, email, virtual demos to persuade at scale and drive technology adoption? And the best part is that you can do this as a team where the effects of it are even larger. And so I put together a program and a community to train and develop the sales team of the future called the Medical Sales Network Effects Program. Why network effects? Because the most powerful companies in the world, from Google to Facebook, uh, Uber, and so on, have used the idea of a network effect, meaning that the larger a network gets, the more valuable it is, the more leveraged it is. And your sales team can use these same kind of principles 
in their outreach digitally so that they can sell at scale without stepping into a hospital. Let me tell you a little bit about the program and how it breaks down. The program is divided into three different areas. It's all centered around content, which is constantly evolving, being updated through our portal. Reps can have access to this both on computer and on their mobile phone so they can learn on the go. And we have events and a community around that. So the content is very simple. With the content, we take first principle foundational uh, topics such as psychology, persuasion, network effects, and more, and help the rep apply it across a variety of different areas. Not only just their LinkedIn profile, but their emails, their presentations, their outreach. So that way, even when your rep has to go in person, they're a lot more effective because they know the principles of psychology and persuasion and they're able to apply it. But then they can do that at scale using the same program. We have fantastic events. Uh, every single week and every month. So every week we have these live calls where we cover a variety of topics from how do you do a virtual demo to how do you shoot a video sales letter to how do you get emails opened? Did you ever think about that? Even before the, pan, uh, pan, uh, before the lockdowns happened, um, we use email. How much email training have you gotten? Probably not much, right? So your reps could be sending all kinds of emails that marketing spent time to develop and it's probably going to the spam inbox because they don't have it formatted a certain way right? Or they didn't write the right subject line so that it actually gets attention, gets opened. Along with our events, we have this great thing called the network grand rounds. These are essentially private zoom calls with special guest speakers, because let's face it, you know, I, as, as talented as, as I am, I don't know everything. There's a lot of things I don't know. So I bring on the best in the industry to give these private zoom calls. And so everybody gets on, uh, they, the speaker gives a topic and then they can ask questions. And if they can't attend live, they can always submit questions ahead of time and then watch the recording. And we've covered topics such as customer success, territory management, capital sales process. Let me give you some examples of those talks we've had. We've had Dr. Ira Kirschbaum, the chair of orthopedic surgery at Bronx Care, the largest nonprofit in the country, give a talk on how to get technology into a hospital. Where else are you going to hear the chair of the department explain how to get capital equipment in? We have Dr. Uh, Sandra Weitz, who teaches the business of medicine to private practice owners, explaining how a rep can be a partner and a contributor to a private practice. We also have reps and, and, and successful sales leaders give talks. So, for example, Jacob McLaughlin, when over at Medtronic, was given a poor performing territory, turned it around in one year to a multi-million dollar success story. He, he provides his flame, framework for that. And, of course our community. We have a growing community online. We have this private LinkedIn group where we use it for con uh, for people to connect with each other and also to share share content and reports. And we have a great a lot of great people in that group. We have influencers such as the Mad Device Rep, uh, executive recruiter Mike Moore, um, other people such as VP, former VPs like uh, Jim Surik. But we also have a lot of sales reps, a lot of uh, young associates who are in there who know how to commercialize and sell digitally, who you can hire onto your team, right? And also, there's plenty of people for you to learn from as well. We have some of uh, the world's top and largest med tech companies that are in our program right now, people from Stryker and Medtronic and John Johnson, but also a lot of startups like Hyperfine. Uh, Petrero Medical, Intercosmos, Moon Surgical, and the list goes on. And of course, we have a growing list of members getting huge results. I mean, I, if you're watching this on YouTube or on Spotify, you can see all these results. You know, anywhere from people getting uh, reached out to online from surgeons to uh, going to conferences and being recognized. So for example, Gaida Lovera, she's in the spine world. She mentioned how surgeons directly message her online to learn about her products, and she's actually recognized when she goes to conference. Franco Dottillo, who uh, at the time joined the program when he was in between jobs, was in a real tough spot, and wrote this beautiful uh, testimony on how the program helped him land a new role and increase his income. And believe it or not, we actually have practicing surgeons in our program. That's right. There's there's. There's there's actual surgeons. So like Dr. Michael Verney, he's a practicing spine surgeon, joined the program because surgeons are wanting to learn how to utilize and leverage things like LinkedIn to control a narrative online. And he mentions how his network has exploded, right? And for this podcast, since you're listening to this, I have a free offer for you. You can get a free LinkedIn profile consult from me and my team and see if you qualify for the program. Plus, we also have team packages. So go ahead and click the link in the show notes below. Book your free consult. The best part is that you're going to walk away with at least three ideas on how to improve your LinkedIn presence so you can sell more and more effectively. So. 
Go ahead and take advantage of this offer. And now let's get back to the show. Let's see here. There we go. Okay, perfect. So let's, I'm going to press play. Okay. And you you want to me? Okay, I will talk, talk over the video. So here you can see the, the patient. Oh, oh let, me, let me go back here. Here we okay, go. Okay, so basically this is one solution. So there is software, hardware, but for the three phases of ablation, which is planning, inserting the needle. Yeah. Oh, and let's go, let me go back. <coughs> Hold on. So going back to uh, what I said, that those three phases, the first is to plan, ah. the second one is to, it's not so working. Oh, it's not working? I don't know, it's, it stopped, no? Oh yeah, yeah, I paused it, that's me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, sorry. so can you just see this little spotlight? Mm, yeah. Okay, so can you tell us real quick, like these these three, three, okay, the three, three components, yeah. Yeah, three components, so, so let's start with the first one right here. Okay, so this is basically the physician console. It's just basically a, a touch screen and a keyboard mm -hmm. and mouse to plan the procedure mm -hmm. and also to operate the robotic arm. So there is a quite a sophisticated, I would say, uh, interface when it comes to medical image review in a, a multiplanar reconstruction, 3D, all the tools that are used to plan the needle trajectory. And by the way, there are some procedures where you have to place two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight needles into the same uh, tumor. So this can get a bit complex. So we have all these tools to plan the intervention and also to pre-visualize what will be the ablation. So you can see your tumor and you can see what will be the ablation based on the settings. Let's say you do 100 watts for uh, six minutes, then the software will tell you, okay, this is what you will cover. And maybe that's not enough because on this border of the tumor, you will have only a three millimeter margin. So you may want to increase to 140 watt or maybe 100 watt during 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's the planning phase and that's for operating the, the robot. Okay. Then the, the second one with the, the two, the right two eyes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the, that's the camera. Basically, that's the, the tracking system that sees everything in the room. The robotic arm the patient, so basically it monitors the patient movements and also monitor the patient breathing because when it comes to soft tissues into the abdomen, they move with the patient breathing. And so what we do is we analyze the, the signals from the, the, the patient reference. So it's a very small device that you, you will see that is taped to the, to the abdomen and we draw the respiratory curve on the on the display screen so that physician can control what's the phase of the respiratory cycle the patient is at the current stage of the procedure and what we do is we synchronize or match the right phase when the image is acquired and when the needle is inserted so basically end of expiration like uh, you will have if you are always at the end of expiration then all your organs are back to the same place Got it. Got that's it. the second component. And the last one is, is, the, is just that's one. That's the robotic just, arm. Yeah, it's a robotic arm with the needle guide. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Let me just let me press play, and I'm going to let you talk through. But if you need me to press pause, tell me, okay? Okay. <clears throat> so this is a, a mobile system. There's an automatic wheel to drive. Those three systems are placed approximately uh, around the patient. There is no, uh, no need to fix it uh, you know, at a very specific place on, this, on the floor. The, so these procedures are under CT guided uh, imaging, which means it's a CT room. So mm -hmm. the camera is seeing everything. And then there is a patient registration to map the actual planning with where is the patient on the table. We can send the patient to uh, the scanner. We do the intraoperative uh, CT scan. Images are loaded to the software. We see here the uh, breathing monitoring. And when we stop breathing, we can see the, 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 the line and we define a reference level for uh, all the procedure that will be, uh, Let me we need to insert. Quick, yeah. quick question, quick question. For the respiratory monitor, how are you guys uh, able to get uh, uh, get this? Is, this? is this coming from that uh, fiducial marker 
right yeah, here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we have this me, uh, signal from the fiducial marker on the on the abdomen of the patient. Let me go back <coughs> a little bit. Oops, maybe. Oh, did I go for too far? Yeah, uh -huh. it's too far. This one. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me go back. Uh, let's see. You have to oh. go back. Oh, more, more, more. Okay, yeah. yeah. Go back. Still, you still have to go back. <coughs> back more, probably. Am I in the right place? Yeah, I think so. So this is the, the planning section. So oh, you can see the ablation I need to go zone. All the, oh, here we go. Sorry. Yeah. Now, yeah. now we're in the right place. So essentially, so essentially, uh, you're able to get this respiratory monitor from this fiducial marker right here. Exact. Correct. Got it. How how is it? How is it? Uh, what's how is it communicating? You know, like that, or is it mainly from the the tower? <coughs> so this device is tracked by the camera that uh, we installed at the, I at, see. the at the patient's feet. So whenever the patient is, I mean, not too far, not too close, but. Uh, the patient uh, position is recorded and analyzed in real time. Got it. Got it. Okay. Let's keep going forward. So now we've set the images. <clears throat> so this is the multiplanar reconstruction. You can look in 3D. You can define where where is the target. You can plan for one or multiple probes uh, insertion. You can choose the ablation modality, the manufacturer, uh, the needle model, and then you define the settings and you get this blue circle that defines what will be the, the ablation zone. There is this navigation feature to confirm everything is right. And then we move to the, the actual phase, the robotic phase of the procedure, where you will basically ask the robot to position the needle guide onto the planned trajectory. So if you do multiple probes, you will go uh, each, each trajectory at a time. And the system and will lock a needle guide along the along the axis. And quick question: so if the patient moves, this, you know, this this fiducial marker is yep. essentially what's making sure that the tower and the robotic arm communicate. How how yep. is this is this being is this uh, on the patient through like an ad adhesive glue or yeah, how? Is it's it? a, yeah, yeah, it's a transparent film dressing that is got uh, it. used for for placing stuff on the skin. Okay, got it, got it. So now you have the universal guide, pre pretty much handles all kinds of ablation needle, and you just have to insert through the guide until the mechanical stop. And based on the needle length that you define on the software, the tip of the needle will reach the target point into the into the tumor. And then you can also quickly release and remove the needle guide from the needle to enable the patient to breathe again. This is a six degrees of freedom uh, robotic arm. It's collaborative. You can move it by hand. And obviously with the software, you can constrain the movement of the needle guide along axis or, or different um, advanced mode, I would say. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, in this entire procedure, where where's the area that you feel that is was the most difficult for you guys to um, to essentially develop? Like for the robot, would it be the would it be the registration side? Registration is always an issue in, in spine surgery, so I'm wondering for you guys, like what 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 part of this was the most difficult? Yeah, I think uh, not necessarily uh, registration because we are into. Uh, intraoperative imaging uh, planning. So it's not like the, the maser where you do, I mean, the software can do it, but right now most people use it with the uh, intraoperative imaging. So the image are already match the patient position. <coughs> it was more on, uh, you know, tracking the patient movement and making sure that uh, we're capable to reach a target inside the, inside the um, uh, soft tissues. So that's uh, what kind of technologies uh, tracking technologies should be used and how we could uh, deliver this, uh, this uh, mechanical guidance. So that's the, I mean, that's the, um, the main challenge we started to tackle is to make sure that we can uh, guide with the robot the insertion of a needle uh, into a, a, a target within the, within the, um, the, the anatomy. That's the, 
that's the main i mean the main and and this is where we came up with the respiratory uh, monitoring technology that is uh, not something that is uh, you know uh, used in orthopedics or or spine or uh, neurosurgery that's specific to this kind of procedures and by the way that's uh, quite common in uh, radiotherapy because they have to say they face the same challenges mm. uh, when the patient is breathing they have to um, activate the the beam uh, only when the, the the patient is the at the right phase of the respiratory cycle so this is very similar to uh, a proven technology in uh, radiation uh, therapy got it got it and i would imagine that that's um, probably one of the areas where there's a lot of issues doing this manually because you know the patient's breathing the you know you're trying to hit essentially a bullseye but the bullseye is moving like this right yeah you know so like even when um like when you when the robotic system has registered it it's it's ha it has the target um and you're inserting inserting the probe does the from a technique standpoint does a physician have to time it and like insert it like a little bit like quickly like when the patient's either exhaling or inhaling or what you know on the technique yep. side what is that like so i mean you're right that's the concept right now is to uh the the robot is used for a very limited portion of time actually you know you place the needle guide and then you insert one pass all the way through the needle so it takes maybe five ten seconds to insert the needle and then the guidance part of the procedure is over doesn't mean that the the it's uh, the the system is not used because then you took another ct scan and then you merge the images and you analyze on the software of the robot that's why we call it a platform uh, that that helps for inserting the needle but also for evaluating the what you've done with the needle and what you've done with the treatment later on but uh, yes the 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 idea is to rather than taking you know maybe 15 minutes when they do freehand they insert a little bit they look at images they correct they insert a little bit they look at images they insert they look at images they correct so it can take a long time so where that's where we introduce a little difference in their uh, conventional technique is that we say okay the robot is controlling the angle and the depth you insert the needle all the way through you release and then you're done got it Got Which, it. by the sense. way, when, when it comes to, uh, I was talking about uh, multiple pro procedures. So when you have larger tumors or tumors close to critical structures, there is another modality that is not heat, not cold. That is what we call the uh, IRE, irreversible mm. electroporation. Which, which can uh, destroy the tumor without damaging healthy tissue. Let's uh, just uh, uh, say it like that. And, but it requires to place two, three, four needles exactly parallel at uh, two 15 millimeter or, or 20 millimeter. And this is very challenging to do uh, free end with a robot. And you know that the, the miser is capable of, you know, placing so many screws in so many levels. You can go and insert the first needle. You move to the next one, you insert the needle, you move to the next one, you insert the needle, and you can do five, four, uh, four or five needles in less than one minute, which would have taken maybe one hour if you do it free end. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. And then like, um, aside from like interventional oncologists, it feels like this is, this is kind of both like interventional oncologist, interventional radiologist. Is that correct? Yeah. So interventional oncology is a subset of interventional radiology with only treatment related to uh, cancer. But, uh, the um, interventional oncologist is an interventional radiologist that is operating on a, <coughs> On, can, on uh, cancer patients, so it's the, it. I mean it's the, the same uh, same people. It's just a specialization in uh, in oncology. Got it. And like again, for a lot of the uh, the sales reps, you know, there's a lot of people who are interested in surgical robotics, but this is like a different area. May, mainly the people who I know who are into robotics, either they're in general surgery or they're in orthopedics. But for this, is this something that um, is mainly limited to, let's say, like a larger hospital or health system, or is this a procedure that can be done at like ambulatory surgical centers, like an ASC? Yeah, so I think uh, I'm not I'm not sure about the US and ASC's uh, center, how it's set up. Uh, for sure, in France, it can be a big hospital or a small hospital. It depends on, I mean, there is uh, 
our first two customers are in uh, Paris and in Lyon, which are the two first big cities. And th there are maybe uh, the, the two big cancer centers among the big cancer centers in, uh, in France. But uh, right next to Montpellier, there is a small city and they have um, a hospital, local hospital there, and they practice this kind of uh, intervention. So it's not restricted to large centers. As Got long it. as you have a, a city room that is dedicated for this kind of treatment and you have enough patients, then this is the kind of procedure you can do. But there are a lot of different procedures also that uh, can be done. <coughs> Got it. Got it. Got it. And so, like, you know, we're wrapping up the year and everything. So for 2023, what are some of the big things that Quantum Surgical is, you know, what are some of the bigger, bigger goals? I'm sure you guys are growing. So I'm sure you guys are probably recruiting and growing your team. But like 2023, what are some things that you guys are focused on? So focus on uh, commercialization. I mean, uh, clinical adoption. So this this really is the is the you guys. Are you guys hiring comes. salespeople in the U.S. yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a oh, team great. of uh, yeah, we have a team of already four people, uh, five people, and we're still hiring in the U.S. So yeah, the goal is to launch the product in the U.S. to grow the uh, installed base in Europe, uh, and we will hopefully uh, get. Uh, uh, clearance from NMPA, so in China as well, and we'll be also able to open this uh, third market, but really focusing on uh, having physicians use the technology and uh, being in close support to these uh, early adopters so that we can refine the technology wherever it needs to be. So that's commercial and clinical uh, phase, and, and also we want to expand the capabilities of the, of the platform. So like you, like uh, we we talked at the beginning, we made uh, a choice not to do a generic tech, not to do a generic intended use, but to do a generic technology, focusing on one one procedure. So we did we did liver ablation. Mm -hmm. So it's not abdominal surgery; it's just liver ablation, and we focused mm -hmm. on this, and we tried to provide as much value as we could before, during, and after liver ablation procedures. That's mm -hmm. where we started. We expanded to kidney cancer, and 2023 we want to expand. <coughs> so we want to expand to more organs, more cancer, to have physicians who have this uh, platform be able to use it for various cases. But uh, we and we this, do it but this is all in, it's all interventional oncology. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. yeah. What, it's, I mean, yeah. what's there? You know what? This is actually a question. I, I actually don't know the answer to this, but like, I'm sure it it, it it's different. Uh, throughout the the globe, but like for example, in spine, you know, you have a lot of different procedures. But like the main bread and butter procedure that every spine surgeon does is like a one to two level fusion, like L four L five or something, right? That's what the, the, yep. they do majority of the cases. For an interventional oncologist, what's the majority of their cases? Is it liver? Is it kidney? Um, so it's, yeah, so it's not the so it's not it it's not the same. Class, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that depends on the region and how hospitals are organized. We can see, see. different uh, different. So, Gustave Roussy, uh, it's a well-known cancer center. They do only cancer patients. So what they do is they do all organs. They do uh, uh, kidney, liver, bone, lungs, whatever they, they can. They do with interventional oncology, with the pretty much the same team. On the other hand, we have uh, uh, another hospital like in Montpellier. They have. Uh, uh, a professor in radiology who is really an expert in liver. So they have a, a department who is doing only liver ablation and another one who is doing only kidney ablation. So the, I mean, the training can be, the, I mean, the technologies are the same. The, the needles are pretty much the same. The, the workflow, the principle is pretty much the same, but uh, people can be either trained for doing all organs. I mean, most organs are trained to do specifically one organs and maybe specifically primary cancer in this organ and not metastasis. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. And so, um, you know, since the year's wrapped up, like there's really no more conferences, but like where, what are some um, upcoming conferences that, um, uh, that people, yes. people can see, see you guys at? Yeah, I think we will do uh, something around eight or two. Eight or ten uh, trade shows uh, next year, 2023. So the main ones is uh, SIO, I think, in January mm -hmm. in the US. Uh, Where is SIO going to happen? You have to ask the marketing team. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think it's a. Uh, if you guys are. Uh, Florida. 
Florida. Okay, I was gonna say if you guys come to anything down here in San Diego, let me know. I'd love to come by and check out check out the technology in person. So SIO is one. What are what are no, some S other yeah, big SIO shows? Yeah, SIO is uh, Washington DC. So then oh, okay. there is a uh, yeah there is so there is two two shows in January uh, in the US. Then there is uh, basically uh, what we call Circe. Uh, what uh, SIR in in the US? Uh, there is um, uh, other events, but. Basically, all the events uh, focused on interventional oncology. Uh, we will be there to showcase the technology. We we were not like at uh, RSNA, which is a very generic trade show about uh, radiology. Mm. Uh, so we are really targeting uh, our effort to educate our customer, our market, which is interventional oncology, uh, with this new technology that is robotics. Got it. Yeah, and I think that's the the thing about uh, radiology that I've noticed compared to, let's say, other other medical specialties is that there's radiology, but then, you know, the the subspecialty, like, for example, if you go to NAS, North American Spine Society, right, you know, there's a lot of spine surgeons there, but you have neurospine surgeons, you have orthopedic spine surgeons, you have scoli, they all kind of go to that. But for radiology, it's kind of like, there's the one, like, broad general radiology show, but then the more specialized ones, like interventional, it's like a completely different world. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, and and interventional radiology. It's a small subset of of radiology. <coughs> I mean, there are thousands and thousands of uh, radiologists, but people who are capable of performing therapeutic procedures with the help of uh, radiologic images. Uh, it's it's a much smaller number. So, this kind of trade shows, it's like between six hundred to three thousand, five thousand uh, attendees. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Fantastic. Well, Lucien, I was going to say, thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to kind of wrap up by asking you a few like rapid fire questions. So kind of okay. quick questions. You can take as long as you want on, on them or as quick as you want, but they're kind of fun questions. Okay. So first question I have for you is, you know, um, part of, you know, part of being in technology and, and tech, you know, med tech is, you know, there's an important part of like learning and education, right? You have to always be learning. That's how you come up with ideas. That's how you go from robotic spine surgery to now like robotic interventional oncology. Um, what's, what's a book that you feel that you, you often give or recommend to other people? And it can, it doesn't have to be a technology book. It can be anything. Okay. It's a good question. I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not much into books. Uh, I, or I'm, podcast. I'm, yeah. So I would, I would recommend listening to podcast. Any kind, I mean, there are a lot of very specific, very focused pod podcasts. I started listening to Project MedTech because it's a, a broad oh, yeah. uh, podcast on everything between, you know, from founding to quality regulatory to clinical affairs to product development. So if you are looking into, you know, uh, be part of an entrepreneurial ad adventure and have some leadership roles in this adventure, this is a, a perfect uh, podcast to really understand all the old things, you know, uh, Metech startup has to know between uh, incorporation and commercial phase. So that's, I mean, one podcast I would recommend. This is one among other uh, podcasts that uh, people can listen to and, uh, and 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 find what they what 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 fit their needs. Got it. And you you have a I, do you have a, you have a podcast yourself? I believe. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> why why didn't you you, should, you need you need to plug that man. <laughs> Don't be so. Yeah. So, what's what's the name of your podcast? So, yeah. So, the I started earlier this year, a less invasive podcast, and it's uh, focused on uh, minimally invasive surgery and enabling technology. So, anything from robotics, uh, AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, telesurgery, telemedicine, and I try to interview industry peers and uh, physicians, surgeons, to really get the grasp on you know what's the need in minimally invasive surgery and what could bring uh, the technologies and what's the future? What's the limitations today and what's the future? Got it. Got it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Good to know. Um, next question for you is, um, if you can accomplish one thing next year, um, that would make it a great year. What would it, what would it be? For me, it's, uh, it's, it's all about uh, the clinical adoption. I mean, uh, there is no point in spending five years uh, developing a technology to uh, with the hope to help uh, improve patient outcomes and not having this technology in the hand of as many surgeons, as many physicians as possible. All the rest, I mean, is 
is byproduct. I mean that there will be success in in the market clearances. Uh, financially, we will be raising money. Uh, we will be growing the team. Uh, we will do a lot of stuff. But uh, at the end of the day, we only do that to have people use our product on patients. And so that's for me the the most important is uh, clinical adoption. So if we you know I don't know if we do. Th- 500, 1,000 procedures, I don't know. We need to forecast these kind of numbers, but that would be the milestone for me. So we reach, right now we reach just a 100 uh, procedure milestone. Oh, congratulations. Is, yeah, so for me, this is the, this is the, this is the metric I'm, I'm following. Got it. Fantastic. And then last question, and we're kind of, we'll kind of wrap up the show. Um, my last question to you is that there's a lot of young um, engineers, product managers that are listening to this. You know, they want to be in a position like you as a CTO and, you know, uh, start a company. What's your best piece of advice for somebody who's interested into starting a robotics company or just becoming a, a CTO? What 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 advice from a career standpoint can you give them? I don't know. I think uh, I would say be curious and uh, go find. Uh, I mean, f- for me, I'm, I'm, uh, the technology is one aspect, but the other one is the market and the customer and the clinical need. And for me, to be a good CTO. Uh, I need for myself to understand the technology, to be able to drive the team that will uh, design this technology, but also to understand the market, uh, to understand the customers, and to understand the clinical environment and the clinical needs. And this is uh, some most of the time engineers that are just focusing on their technology, their piece of software, their mm-hmm. mechanical instrument. But what makes the difference between two engineers is the one that say, okay, I understand why I'm doing this this product, why I'm designing this technology, and I will use that knowledge right uh, at the beginning of the of the design phase. And I will be able to support the customer because I will be able to talk to the customer because I will understand what the customer tell me when he say, "Okay, uh, tomorrow I want to do a, a sacro col poplexi." If you say, "Okay, what what it is?" then you don't talk to the customer. If you know what's the name of the procedure, if you know what an anastomosis means, if you know uh, what's the challenges when you do uh, suturing in a, uh, in, in a heart surgery, then you're most likely uh, in a better position uh, to design a, a meaningful technology. That makes, yeah, and I completely agree. And I think especially like, um, you know, as, you know, if, you, if you're in product or engineering, there's a, uh, there's a tendency to spend a too much time close to the technology and i think the best engineers i mean one i think we both uh he's he's a good friend of mine and i used to uh work with him is like jeff alvarez uh, who's over at moon surgical yep the one thing i noticed about jeff i mean you know he's an engineer's engineer like he was employee number one at oris um but he spent so much time like uh with the customers understanding them even when we we're at patro you know his thing is like just talk to as many customers as possible, continue to talk to talk to them. Cause then you start to really understand you get closer to the problem. And I think the closer the problem you get, uh, the more you're able to understand like how you can actually develop some innovation that's going to help the customer and the patient versus coming up with some cool technology that's expensive. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, well, perfect. Lucien, hang out for a little bit. Uh, we're going to chat right now. I'm going to cue the exit music. Everyone, thank you so much for joining. This is another episode of the State of MedTech. Do us a favor if you're listening to this live, Go to our, uh, our, our our podcast pages. You'll see the links uh, below, either Spotify or Apple. Give us five stars. Write a review. We are breaking into the top 10 in the healthcare category. We're already in the top 1%, um, but we haven't quite cracked that top 10 yet, so help us get there. So with that being said, my name is Omar Khatib. I'm your host and head of state for the state of MedTech, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of The State of MedTech. I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib. Do us a favor. If you like this episode, share with somebody and go ahead on Apple and Spotify, wherever you are, leave a five-star review. Type a few nice notes about us. This is how we get other people to find the show. Thank you. and We'll see you next time.